anything else? Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Nipon, who will introduce today's speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Michelle Milinkovic. So I only met him 10 minutes ago, but uh, <laughs> I am familiar with his work, and so it's really a pleasure to have him here. So he got his PhD at Yale, and then his initial faculty position was in Brussels. And um, now, since 2008, he's been at the University of Geneva. And um, he's really worked on quite a number of systems where I think he describes his own work as being focused on non-model or non-standard model reptiles and mammals. And um, he's really combined a lot of different fields in terms of using phylogenetics and evolutionary comparisons, developmental <coughs> genetics, and mathematical modeling to make some really interesting insights into lots of interesting aspects of, of reptile biology. And so some of the recent work that he's done, and I don't know exactly which of these we'll touch on um, necessarily today, but for example, he had a paper a while back on showing that the cracking pattern on the faces of crocodiles could be math modeled mathematically and wasn't really set up in any particular genetic way. And then he um, did some really interesting molecular comparisons to come up with a, a model of the evolution of scales, hairs, and feathers all from an ancestral type of skin appendage. And then uh, one of my favorite papers was a, a recent paper on um, chameleons, and so on the color change that chameleons can undergo, and most people had always thought that that was by moving around pigments and chromatophores, and he showed that they could actually modify photonic crystals um, in real time and to achieve color change. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thank you, Nico. So, hi everyone. It's a really a great pleasure to be in wonderful uh, and, and, uh, and to meet different people, including David, that I have not seen for so many years. And really nice to see you. Um, so indeed, um, for the last eight years, uh, the activities in my lab have been focused uh, on, to put it broadly, evo devo and physics of skin appendages and skin color invertebrates. And I will just very quickly give you two examples uh, regarding skin <coughs> appendages, and then we'll go more into details about our investigation of skin colors. So, first about skin appendages. <coughs> As you all know, when you look at the diversity of skin appendages in, uh, in um, amniotes, for example, you have morphologies that are so different between hair, feathers, and scales, for example, that people have been discussing for decades about the homology or non-homology of these structures, given that they are so different morphologically, it's of course difficult to investigate. And one of the reasons why this controversy has been going on for so long is because hair and feathers develop from an anatomical placode, uh, which is a local thickening of the epidermis with very specific characteristics like columnar cells within the placode and a whole set of signaling signatures as well that we will go into maybe a bit more details later in the talk. And then later, of course, hair and feathers will develop quite differently, as you know, but still uh, they will form follicular organs, right? And um, the big problem with this picture is that scales in squamates uh, are supposed not to develop from uh, plaque holes. And obviously, given that birds and mammals do not form a monophyletic group at the exclusion of reptiles, this forces people to suggest that plaque holes were invented twice independently, which is obviously very surprising, once in birds and once in mammals. Now, um, this of course would also suggest that hair, for example, and scales are not homologous. And there are quite a few people who have been discussing the possibilities uh, uh, different scenarios for the origin of hair in mammals, for example. Um, some uh, authors have suggested that they evolved as mechanosensory organs in between scales and uh, the other uh, hypotheses out there, but basically the idea being that hair are interscale uh, organs and therefore are not homologous uh, to scales. Then, of course, there is also a series of authors who uh, um, have serious doubts about these hypotheses, but they didn't have much to, you know, put forward as data uh, to prove the homology, if any, uh, between the different uh, um, skin appendages. Then, in my lab, we got a great help <laughs> from this animal. 
this naked lizard. So this is a, a bird dragon from Australia, but this animal is not normal at all. This is not a wild type phenotype. This animal has no scale whatsoever. Okay, and I found this animal in a in a <coughs> fair, in a pet trade fair, and. Um, as you know, fanciers who, who are breeding reptiles and birds and, and amphibians, etc., these people are very knowledgeable and they immediately told me, yeah, yeah, I think this is a recessive mutation when I look at the crossing that I'm getting, etc. And of course I got interested uh, to identify the genes responsible for the lack of scales in these animals. So I bought these animals and we started to breed <laughs> them and indeed confirmed that this is a monolocus um, uh, recessive mutation, this is a wild type a bird a dragon, uh, called like this because of course you have here these flat scales that become spiny here, and uh, you have also spines on the side and different types of scales on the, on the back. And this is the heterozygous individual, all the scales are there but they are smaller in size, especially the spines, as you can see. And then the homozygous mutant has no scale whatsoever. Right? Okay, so uh, we were interested to identify the mutations responsible for this phenotype, and I asked um, Nicolas Dipoy, an excellent postdoc uh, in my lab, to compare the development of the skin between wild type and scaleless bearded dragons. And while he was doing this, he um, produced amazing data demonstrating that actually there are placodes in wild type bearded dragons. So we have here the local thickening of the epidermis with the columnar cells. We, all have, all, we have a reduced proliferation of these cells, which is also a characteristic of a, a black coat. And then all the signaling that goes with it, like for example, restricted sonic hedgehog expression in subpopulations of cells expressing beta catenin. And obviously, this prompted us to look into more details into additional lineages of reptiles. And sure enough, we found the uh, placodes in snakes and crocodiles. So obviously, this makes the whole story much simpler. Uh, placodes did not uh, evolve twice independently, uh, or were not lost in many lineages independently, which was also something that had been suggested before. But this is actually a synapomorphy for for um, uh, um, for amniotes, probably possibly even deeper. I mean, nobody has been investigating this, but I would suggest that we should look into amphibians a little bit more. Uh, but at least, at least amniotes, this is why I always now say that amniotes should be called placodians, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, of course, the very first question, so sorry, I'm going fast into this because I will focus on color mostly during the talk, but uh, of course much more information is available in the, in the paper. Um, the first question I'm always asked is why people didn't see that before, right? I mean, this controversy has been going on for decades now. Well, the reason is pretty simple. When you look at a mouse, for example, and you want to observe placode, that's not very difficult because you're going to have a first wave of placode development, all right, about everywhere on the body. And then if you miss these placodes, there will be a second wave, and then a third wave because you have the different types of hair, God hair, whole hair, zigzag hairs, etc., that will indeed develop in different waves. So it's quite difficult to miss the placode in a, in a mouse development. But what we realize is that in reptiles, the dynamic is very different. You actually have some very specific regions on the body where the placodes will form in a very transitory fashion uh, in time, okay? And if you look there, a bit too early, you don't see the placodes yet, and if you look a little bit too late, it's not a placode anymore, it's already your early scale, and you have to look in a specific direction because they developed as tracts, right? So obviously now that we characterize all these tracts, it's much easier to uh, find them if you want to look, have a look at them yourself. Okay, so now, um, initially we wanted to identify that mutation, right? And then we came across this uh, fascinating data. And um, when you look at the wild type versus uh, the scaleless uh, phenotype, we realize that the, the latter uh, doesn't have scales, of course, but it also lacks all the femoral glands, right? Mm -hmm. And we found some uh, defects in the development of the teeth and in the development of the clubs. And this is very suggestive of a very specific pathway which is very well known to be involved in the development of 
hair, feathers, claws, teeth, mammary glands, etc. And this is the EDA pathway. So we thought maybe we can be lucky and we just sequence the major um, uh, members of the pathway, which is the EDA path pathway for ectodysplasin A. And indeed, we found a very clear mutation in the EDA gene where you actually have a transposon that is inserted in the exon uh, 7 and generate a new splice donor site and this ends up by giving a deletion of a 40, uh, 14 amino acid fragment in one of the most conserved region of the TNF domain of the gene. So uh, uh, mutation that has obviously a very strong effect uh, on the function of the protein. So we, of course, went further, and again, if you're interested, uh, much more information is available of the, in the original paper, but we looked, of course, at uh, signaling in the development of the plaque code of uh, the uh, wild tab individuals, and then we realized that actually it's a bit cynical. The reason why scaleless dragons don't have scales, it's because they fail to form plaque codes, all right? Yeah. So they fail to form what people thought they didn't have, but actually, if you don't have a plaque code, you cannot make a skip, okay? So we looked into uh, these different uh, signaling. Um, again, um, uh, you can refer to the paper if you're interested. So basically, uh, the anatomical plaque code in reptile scale morphogenesis indicates shear ancestry among skin appendages and amniotes. So now the story is much is actually much simpler. Okay. So now, what about physics in here, right? Physics of skin appendages. Well. Um, we are interested in my lab not only into comparing skin appendages among major lineages, but also uh, within uh, lineages like lizards, for example, you find, of course, a tremendous variety of scaled morphs, forms, and shapes, right? You can have flat scales, uh, you can have nodular scales, spiny scales, keel scales, etc., etc. Same thing in, in uh, um, snakes, of course, many of them have very flat overlapping scales, but others have keel snake. Uh, sorry, scales, etc. Same thing in mammals, of course, you have a tremendous variation on the shape and size of the hair. And for example, we also have colonies of tenrex and hedgehogs. Uh, as you know, tenrex are afrotheria, so they are more, more closely related to uh, elephants than to hedgehogs. And uh, <laughs> these represent, therefore, two lineages that independently evolved spines. And we are also investigating how twice in evolution, of course, it's much more than twice, there are many of the lineages of mammals which have spines, but how a hair follicle was transformed into a spine-producing organ. So that's the kind of thing we are interested in. Too. But then, when you look into the development of feathers of hair and of scales, actually, it looks like you always <coughs> have the same major principle, which is that each of these uh, skin appendages is a developmental unit. Right? So the patterning of these units is generated through a reaction diffusion turing like mechanism. And for example, if you take this uh, snake here, um, this is a stage where the skin is completely uh, smooth. There is no morphological differenti differentiation of scales yet. But you can, of course, by using some uh, probes uh, targeting early developmental genes, you can already identify the group of cells that will jointly form a scale. Right, And same thing for hair, same thing for um, uh, feathers. Okay, and now what we came across is a major um, exception to this, which are the scales on the face and jaws of crocodiles. So when you look into a um, uh, snake, for example, this reaction diffusion system generates a given pattern, but also on the head you can easily recognize the different scales. Uh, uh, the labial scales, the, the internasal scales, etc. Uh, so the position, size, number of neighbors, etc. of these scales is very predictable. This is why, by the way, it's used, of course, as a taxonomic character in snakes, for example. But then, when you take the uh, 3D geometry of the head of the snake and you mark the scales and you make, for example, left to right uh, a mirror image, so you, you transfer the, the, the left to the right, for example, here, and you see, of course, yes, it's predictable, and you see a very a good correspondence between the left and the right. But if you do the same with a crocodile, this is surprisingly messy, all right? So the uh, number of neighbors, the size, um, 
the shape of each of these scales is extremely variable. Now, if you take two different individuals and you make non-rigid alignment, you will also realize that it's very different from individual to individual. So there is a very strong stochastic aspect to this pattern. So again, I will go very fast for uh, this here, but for, to make a long story very short, what we real realized when we <coughs> analyzed uh, statistically these patterns, it was giving us statistical signatures of cracking, right? Cracking like in cracking mud, or in cracking porcelain, or plastic, or starch, whatever, or lava, okay? So that was <coughs> sort of a very strange result, obviously. And the physics of cracking is very well understood, and um, this required the accumulation of tension field in a in a layer of material that is actually shrinking because, uh, for example, it's cooling, right? So it's losing heat, or if it's losing uh, some component like water, it's all also going to shrink. And because it's adherent to another layer, the shrinkage is actually frustrated, and you have tension that is accumulating, and then you have cracks that appear and propagate in a very specific fashion that is very well understood in uh, physical terms. Okay, so that we see this in the head of the crocodiles sounds very strange. So obviously, the next step was to gather embryos of crocodilians and to look at what's going on. And then uh, what we realized is that, yes, you find tons of little developmental units, for example, by using classical, uh, uh, again, this is beta catenin in classical early developmental genes for the skin, uh, but these do not correspond to scales at all. They correspond to skin, up and, uh, to skin um, um, uh, sensory organs that we can discuss if you want to. I, again, I don't have the time to discuss this, although we have a paper on this. Um, but these don't correspond to scales at all. So where are the scales coming from? Well, you start with your smooth skin, and then on the side of the face, you have grooves that appear, right? And then they propagate across the face they start to join with each other randomly, more or less randomly, again following rules that are very similar to cracking. And then you have grooves that appear in different orientations, again, exactly like in cracking mud. And finally, you get a pattern where what is called a scale is actually not a scale, developmentally speaking. It's not a developmental unit at all. It is a random piece of skin, highly keratinized, that has a shape and a number of neighbors and a size that is a function um, of how these different groups connected with each other. Okay, so that was also a fun, uh, a fun result to realize that actually these scales are not homologous at all to all the other scales that you can find, uh, including on the body of the crocodiles. Right, because on the body of the crocodile, this is not a process analogous to cracking. So again, if you are interested. Uh, to look into this, um, this is a 2013 paper where we show that indeed crocodile head scales are not developmental units but emerge from a process analogous to physical cracking. Okay, so that's all for skin appendages. And I will switch now to another topic which is uh, pretty important in my lab. Uh, and, and namely, the pigmentary and structural colors in squamates. So squamates are absolutely spectacular in terms of the variety of colors that you can find. You can find bright greens, bright yellow, reds, blues, oranges, yellows, etc. And this is not only in snakes, this is true as well in lizards, and I always insist when I show this picture, no, this is not photoshopped, these are <laughs> real, real uh, <laughs> colors of real animals. And you have this fantastic diversity of colors, but also a large diversity of patterns, of course, you know, spots, labyrinths, stripes, etc. So these are things we are interested in too. And if you look at um, um, the physics of color, obviously light is an electromagnetic radiation, and you have a huge spectrum from gamma rays to uh, long radio waves, and obviously when we speak about visible light, is a very tiny portion of it from 400 to 700 uh, nanometers. Now when you speak about colors, the first thing that comes to mind is obviously pigments, right? And <coughs> the way pigments work 
is that they deplete white light from some wavelength and therefore the light acquires a color, right? So for example, if you take a yellow pigment, it's yellow because it's absorbing blue wavelengths and therefore you are left with everything else from green to red and this gives us the impression of yellow, okay? Um, now, we were interested to investigate these kind of things in a group of lizards from the genus Felsuma from Madagascar, it's a beautiful uh, and very diverse genus when you have a large variety of different colors. And you, of course, indeed, you have pigments in these animals. If you take this piece of skin here, for <coughs> example, this is yellow pigment. But if you take the green skin of this animal, there is also yellow pigment in there. And you can remove this yellow pigment uh, for example, in this case, we, we, we use ammonium, uh, ammonium uh, hydroxide and you transform the green skin into blue skin because you remove the yellow pigment. You can do the same with the red marks here because this is also a pigment, so you can isolate the red pigment. <coughs> now, first big surprise is that when you do chromatography of the red and the yellow pigment, within a species, you get exactly the same profile. This is another species, again, you get exactly the same profile between red and yellow. Now, if you take uh, each of these peaks and you do mass spectrometry, these are exac exactly the same molecules. Some of them are known, like Santopterin. Others are unknown molecules, very likely to be pterins, but the same molecules, exactly the same mass. So these animals are able to make red and yellow with exactly the same pigment. So the only possibility is that, of course, that you have some chemical modification of these compounds, like pH or redox states, that would modify their electronic properties and therefore generate different colors because they would absorb different wavelengths. Okay? So, do Falsuma lizards do that? Well, yes, indeed, they seem to do this because if you take this piece of skin here that is yellow, you can make it bright red, bright red sorry, by changing the pH. And if you take a piece of red skin, you can make it bright yellow by uh, changing the redox state. Okay? So now we want to go into more details to understand how these animals actually do this. But <coughs> it's not that surprising in terms of cell biology. Because of course these pigments are intras in intracellular compartments that are very well known by cell biologists to be machines for changing pH, for example. Okay? So uh, we want to go into this, but um, this is work in progress. Okay, so now let's take again the case of this green skin um, for which we removed the yellow pigment. And this yellow pigment is contained in these cells that are called xanthophores, right? But what is this blue? This blue is not due to a pigment. This due is a structural color that is generated through a uh, physical mechanism that is called light interference. And this is um, working like this. This is exactly actually the, the same principle as what's occurring in a soap bubble. So if you take soap without dye in the soap, so it's, it's colorless soap, and you make a bubble, the bubble will uh, display uh, colors, right? It will be iridescent. <coughs> you will have red, you will have blues, etc. <coughs> okay, so what's happening is that if you take the incident light coming with this angle and you, the observer is there, when the light hits the first uh, interface here, it can be reflected or refracted, right? And then when it reaches the second interface between the soap and the inside of the bubble, which is air, obviously, you can have again refraction or reflection. So now let's just follow two rays. One of them is this one where the light is refracted, reflected, and refracted. And then we take a second ray that is directly reflected. So these two rays travel different distances. The first one travel an extra distance, which is x or y. All right? If this distance is equal to an integer times the wavelength, then by definition, these two rays will come out in phase. Right? So you will have an increased signal, and you will see the red as being very, very visible. And of course, if this is true for the red light, it's not true for the, for the blue light, because the wavelength is different and the system is the same. So the extra distance is different from an integer times the blue wavelength. So the two rays will come out not in phase, possibly 
uh, are annihilating each other perfectly if the <coughs> shift, sorry, is half a wavelength. So the blue light will be, uh, the blue signal will be reduced tremendously. Okay, and this is this is a structural color uh, system. Now, in these lizards, the blue is generated also as a structural color because under these xanthophores we have these very special cells that are called iridophores that contain tiny, tiny nanocrystals of guanine. And as you can see, this is actually a felsuma, so it's, it's one of these bright green lizards. You see that these <coughs> nanocrystals are organized as layers. All right? They are pretty well organized as a 1D photonic crystal. Okay? So now when the light hits this structure, this is perfectly transparent. Light is going through, except the wavelengths that will indeed interfere constructively and will therefore be reflected. But this is much more efficient than in a soap bubble, because in a soap bubble you just have two, these two interfaces. Here you have tons of interfaces between two materials. One is the cytoplasm and this, the other one is the guanine. Right? By the way, guanine is very efficient by doing this because the refractive index of guanine is tremendously high. Okay? So you have a system like this where you have indeed light interference, but this is so efficient that if you have about 10 layers of these nanocrystals, you have a reflectivity of 100% for a specific uh, wavelength. <coughs> this explains why these colors are so intense, so bright. Okay? Now, what are the wavelengths that are reflected it's a function of several parameters, but a very important one, of course, is the distance among these layers of nanocrystals. Right? So imagine now that we could manipulate this. Imagine that we could push on the skin of the animal, compress the skin, compress the cells, and therefore compress the lattice, you know, the layers of nanocrystals. We would reduce the distance between the nanocrystals. So we would get a shift would it be a red shift or a blue shift of the light that is reflected? Sorry? <laughs> Are we going to reflect shorter or longer wavelength? Right? Shorter, right? So we should see colors that are more blue. So here we go. We push on the skin with tweezers, and you go from green to bright blue. <laughs> <laughs> so this really demonstrates that this is a structural color. Right? And of course, if you wait long enough, this is reversible because the cells will swell again, etc., etc. It takes some time. But you go from bright blue to okay. So now again, if we look at these Felsuma lizards, um, the different species with, with quite a, a variety of colors, goes from bluish to very green to uh, yellowish. I didn't show the whole diversity. It's really tremendous. Um, now we understand that the final uh, color that you see in this background color uh, is a function of the amount of yellow pigment you get in the skin and of the geometry the organization of these nanocrystals, okay? So what will be reflected? Obviously what is reflected is not just, in this case it's mostly blue. The peak of reflectivity is centered on blue, but it's quite wide. The reason being that this geometry is not perfect. Of course, if the geometry was absolutely perfect, the distance was exactly the same all the time, you would get a very narrow band uh, reflectivity, but it's it's actually center on blue and you have a lot of green which is also reflected. Okay? Now, if you look at these red marks, <coughs> they are pretty red. They are not purplish. And if you would have behind this skin, you would have iridophores that reflect blue and green. You know, I would not expect this to be bright red. So we thought maybe they don't have iridophores behind the red marks. Actually, it's full of iridophores, but these iridophores are very special. They are completely disorganized. The crystals mm. are very variable in size, very variable in orientation, and the interdistance among these crystals is extremely variable. So what you get now 
is not anymore a narrow band reflector. What you get is a broadband reflector. It's reflecting a bit of everything. It's reflecting <coughs> white light. All right? So it's actually increasing the brightness of these red marks. Okay? And by the way, this is exactly also the iridophores that we find on the belly of these animals. Mm -hmm. This is why it's this beautiful ivory white. So we always you know, think about white as being the absence of something, but here it's not at all the case. This is structural white. Okay? Here we go. So now we can understand why this guy, if you look at the background color, why it's green. It's green for a complicated reason. It's green because the white light comes in and the yellow and the red wavelengths, they just go through. Okay? They are not absorbed by the pigments, they are not reflected by the photonic crystals, though they will eventually, of course, be absorbed by deeper tissues. <coughs> then you have the blue wavelengths, and this is absorbed by the pigment, right? Depending on how much pigment, yellow pigment you have, you have more or less blue that is absorbed, but it's reflected by the photonic crystals, so it's absorbed again on the way out. So you actually have basically no blue that is coming back into your eye. And what is left yeah. is green. Okay? So what is fantastic is that these animals are green not because of an impression of green. It's real green. That's the only thing that can come out from the skin because of this reflectivity combined with the filtering by the uh, yellow pigments. Okay? All this complicated stuff to look like a pigment. <laughs> which is chlorophyll, okay, which is everywhere, but that mm -hmm. vertebrates cannot make. Okay, so obviously <laughs> we got also interested into how chameleons change color. So this is of course very well known that they change color. Um, <coughs> obviously they cannot do whatever they want. There is this myth that a chameleon can take any pattern and color. This is of course not true at all. It's basically a two-state system where you have a very cryptic color, and they are indeed extremely difficult to spot on the field. And then these mature males that are very um, cryptic, if you show them another mature male, they're going to get very angry, right? <laughs> and they will become as visible as possible. So they will change color. And they will become bright yellow in this case. Uh, there are other morphs or other species that will become bright orange or even red. Now, there is quite some variation, but it's always a red shift. Okay? All right, they will actually also display like this towards females to uh, potentially attract uh, receptive females. Okay, so it's always the same story. The males try to be, uh, to look as strong and as beautiful as possible, mm -hmm. all right? To attract the females and to chase away the other males. So now, how does it work? Um, People have been uh, indeed um, thinking for many years now that this is due to dispersion aggregation of pigments. And of course, this is not a bad hypothesis at all, because that is what is happening with melanin, right? So let's be clear here. I'm talking about color change, hue change. I'm not speaking about the fact that the animal is getting darker or lighter, right? You can, came ex you can keep exactly the same hue, but become very dark. So when you see a chameleon that is, you know, basically black, this actually can be green. But the green is very dark, right? And it looks <coughs> basically black. So this is indeed working because of the dispersion and aggregation of melanin. This is true for fish. This is true for amphibians. It's actually a video by Richard Wheeler in Fish <coughs> where you see indeed that the melanosomes can be sent in the uh, fingery extensions of the melanocytes, right? And then the skin becomes very dark, and then the skin be can become very uh, uh, clear if, of course, you have aggregation of the melanosomes. And people simply extrapolate, and they thought, well, if it's true for melanosome, maybe it's true for the other pigments. But actually, we found that this is not the case for several reasons, uh, including the fact that the morphology of these cells that contain these pigments doesn't fit with this hypothesis. <coughs> 
Instead, what we found is that in the chameleon skin, this panther chameleon work, so Fusifer pardalis, uh, we find two layers of iridophores. The first layer, call, call it S iridophore for superficial iridophores, they contain an amazing lattice of nanocrystals. You remember in the Felsuma, we had um, 1D crystal, okay, photonic crystal. I mean that you have layers that are organized in one direction. But in these chameleons, we find a 3D photonic crystal, where you actually have uh, FCC symmetry for face-centered cubby. How we uh, um, infer this, uh, it's by sectioning the, the iridophores in different orientation. So this is an FCC lattice. If you, if you cut it in the plane of the screen here, you get these little squares. Okay, That's what you get here. Now you get the same um, geometry, and you rotate it, and you get this, and you cut again. You will get these hexagons with a central additional element. That's what you see here. Okay, so by you know a lot of section, you can <laughs> actually identify the geometry of these things. In this case, it's an FCC lattice. So I remind you that these are tiny crystals of about 150 uh, nanometers uh, of size. Okay. Then there is a second layer of iridophores with this is the same scale with larger uh, nanocrystals, and they're also more disorganized. I I will allude to these very shortly because, again, uh, for, for, for time constraints. So let's look at the S iridophores first. Well, the first experiment we did was very simple. We took a chameleon. We did that, of course, with many individuals. But if you take this individual here, it's green. And then again, you show him another chameleon. It gets angry and gets yellow. <laughs> OK? And you just take a video of the process. And then we take each. Um, frame of the video, and we simply compute the average color of the animal. And then you plot that in a color space, like CIE color space. And each of the frames is one of these red dots here, behind the, 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 the white line. Okay? So you get a trajectory of color change, and you see indeed that you are losing a blue component and you are gaining a yellow orange component. Okay. So that's a trajectory of color change on the whole animal in vivo. And of course, when you see this, and you see that, it's very tempting to think that maybe these animals are able to themselves uh, modify the geometry of their lattice of nanocrystals. That they can change the distance among these nanocrystals. Right? So to test this, we do numerical simulations where we take an FCC lattice and then we compute the optical response of this system for a given alpha parameter, distance among the nanocrystals. Then we change this parameter and we recompute the optical response. So we also get a trajectory of color change. And that trajectory, which is an in silico inferred by numerical simulations trajectory, is the white line here. Okay? So you get an amazing fit between that numerical simulation and the in vivo observation on the whole animal. So this gets, you know, a pretty uh, good hypothesis, but we wanted to infer, to uh, investigate it further. So first thing to do that looks very simple, but it's actually complicated, I can go into the details if you're interested, is to sample the animal when it's excited and not excited, okay? So basically what you do is that you take an animal that is in the resting state, you take a very small biopsy punch, on the skin, you ensure that the skin is still red when you do that, okay? Because the sample can sometimes, you know, become very dark and things like that. We wanted to have samples that are clearly green. You fix that, and then you show another animal, another male, you get excited, and you take a biopsy just one millimeter next to the first one. You check that it's still yellow, you fix it, and you do. Uh, uh, electron microscopy, and indeed you see that in the relaxed state the nanocrystals are close packed, and in the excited state the distance is larger. All right? First thing. Then there are other experiments, but the most important one, I think, or the most convincing one, <coughs> I think, is, is this one, where we actually take a piece of skin ex vivo and we manipulate the osmolarity of the medium. Right? So we hope to make the cells swell or shrink um, 
and therefore change the lattice geometry. And when you do this, you see that when you look at a single cell, you see that the cell is changing color, right? From red to blue by all the colors of the rainbow, okay? And when you take a movie of that cell, just the cell, not the whole animal, but that single cell, and again, you take the different frames of the video, you have the red dot here. Again, you have the same trajectory, okay? So this is the ac an actual video where we do this, where you have one of these iridophores, and you see that it can go from red, orange, yellow, green, <coughs> blue, etc. Okay, and this is reversible. So this demonstrates that these cells have the potential to change color in a way that mimics exactly what you see in vivo. Now for those interested in the numerical simulation, the, the way we do that is that we are actually computing the uh, optical response in what is called the, the, the irreducible first brilliant zone. So uh, for those interested, this is basically a 3D uh, Fourier transform of the spatial wave function and then you get the average color across all the possible direction that is represented here and this is the alpha parameter, so the distance among these crystals. And the values that we have here correspond very reasonably to <coughs> values that we observe in the electron microscopy uh, images that you have seen. Okay, so that's for the s iridophore. Now for the d iridophores, again, maybe if you have questions I can go deeper, but I will not have time to go uh, to discuss this now, but basically we realize that you have these d iridophores in all the chameleons. In the panda chameleons I showed you, these are three additional species in very different places of the phylogenetic tree of chameleons. So you see that this is specific to chameleons. Other lizards, yes, they have iridophores, but they have one type, like the felsumas that we discussed before. So what are these deep iridophores doing? We continue to investigate this, but already in, in, the, in, in the native communication paper, we uh, suggest that they play a role in heat protection because they are actually uh, involved clearly in uh, reflectivity, massive reflectivity in the near infrared range. And this reduces a lot the amount of energy that the animal is absorbing. So chameleons can change color. It was thought to be dispersion aggregation of pigments. We actually show this is due to the active tuning on a, of a, a lattice of gunning nanocrystals. This is actually the first case of a 3D photonic crystal made of in nanocrystals, because in insects they are these 3D <coughs> photonic uh, structures, but this is not at all made with the guanine crystals. <coughs> and then there is a deeper population of iridophores that possibly provide passive thermal protection. And this organization <coughs> into two superposed layers is an evolution novelty for, for chameleons. Okay? If you're interested to show this to your student, there is a video that's been done by Derek Miller. I don't know if you know this guy, he's, he's a very cool physicist uh, in Australia who is doing videos uh, to explain some physical concepts and he was kind enough to uh, use our paper to make a video about how chameleons uh, change color. Okay, so what about Devo of course because we want to understand how these things developed, right? This is, believe it or not, this is absolutely uncharted territories. Nobody knows how uh, these animals can generate these nanocrystals and how they can organize them spatially. Not even in zebrafish, right? Zebrafish also have iridophores that are a little bit more boring than in chameleons, let's say. <laughs> but still, they have iridophores. So we are teaming up with a, a very good friend of mine, a fantastic scientist who is a, a, a Marcos Gonzalez Guyton, who is a biochemist and cell biologist, and he's a specialist uh, of development in Drosophila, but also a zebrafish, and we are investigating this together with our uh, students. So this is Rita. Uh, is postdoc who is a development biologist, and Alexandra is one of my postdocs, she's physicist, and this is uh, Marcel Arrigo, a PhD student who is a, a, a development biologist as well in my lab. Okay, so unfortunately uh, this is work in progress, so I don't have much to tell you for the moment, but I hope that in a couple of years we'll get some nice results. So, uh, okay, I will finish by speaking very quickly about now the EVO. <laughs> of skin patterns. Uh, stop me if I'm too long, eh? I can just skip, uh, skip it if necessary. <coughs> but I think it's going to be fast. So um, if you take snakes, 
they can have extremely different patterns, right? So for example, you see this snake with dorsal saddles and lateral blotches, and then you see this animal with the longitudinal line. This cannot be more different, okay? Um, and indeed, you find many different species with different patterns. But now here, these are not different species. This is a single species, this corn snake. Uh, and again, thanks to fanciers who have been breeding these for decades now, they are of course always interested when there is a mutant that pops out in the population, immediately it becomes, you know, an animal that is worth a lot of money and blah, blah. <laughs> and uh, we have been gathering uh, for the last eight to ten years all the possible interesting morphs in corn snakes. The idea being that we could maybe uh, do um, SNP cost segregation studies for uh, mutation mapping. So obviously these are not zebrafish, so we have to gather our own molecular data. So this is my wife, Athanasia Tsika, and uh, her fantastic Spanish student, uh, Asie uh, Ilate, who is a bioinformatician. And they are gathering tons of data that are extremely useful for all these projects. Transcriptomics data, if you're interested, this is, of course, available to the community. Uh, at the uh, reptilian <coughs> transcriptomes um, website, but also genomes. We have the corn snake genome, draft genome that we published a, a couple of years ago, and now we have a much, much, much better genome, um, which is not draft at all anymore. We have fragments that are bigger than 25 megabases, and we have half of the genome that is in less than 280 uh, fragments. So this is, of course, very useful for gene mapping. And of course, we have to make the families. That's why, you know, generation time is three to four years, so you can imagine. So this took us, indeed, almost 10 years. But now all the families are there. And I think we're going to come out in the following two years with all, hopefully, uh, as many at least as possible uh, of these mutations. So just to show you that it's feasible, <coughs> this is the first phenotype that we uh, investigated uh, so this is a normal corn snake, the dorsal saddles, the lateral blotches, these magnificent uh, checkers on the belly. And then you have this amelanistic snake. This is the oldest known mutation uh, in uh, corn snakes. And then we wanted to uh, map the mutation. So we did uh, new generation sequencing and uh, SNP core segregation. We found a 5 megabase per interval and a few interesting candidate genes, one of them being an amazingly good candidate gene because it's the OCA2 genes, very well known to be involved as a major determinant of human skin, hair, and eyes color. So we thought, well, maybe it's worth just going directly to that gene and sequence it, and sure enough, uh, we found a large retroposon that has been inserted in an intron uh, of the gene that generates three new exons that are spliced here and generates stop codons, generating therefore a very substantial truncation of the protein. So now, uh, the reason why I wanted to investigate that one is that it didn't make sense when people were telling us, well, these animals don't have melanocytes. That's not possible because at least what is known in zebrafish is that this Turing uh, pattern-like system, this reaction diffusion-like system, uh, requires iridophores and fours and melanophores. So there is, of course, the fantastic work uh, done by Christian Nussen Volhart and Max Planck, who has been investigating that in detail and showing that you knock down um, uh, one of these, you don't get a normal pattern. And Kondo in, in uh, Japan has shown indeed that it reacts as a, as a Turing system. And that's unpublished data. Uh, this is submitted. We have this um, first mapping of mutations related to patterns, right? So this is the white type snake where you have the, again the dorsal saddles, lateral blotches and, and, you know, and the checkers on the belly. And then we have actually three alleles. That's a white type allele. If you are homozygous for the motley allele, <coughs> you have those, the saddles that get elongated parasagitally, right? So they tend to join each other. And they actually do in the neck region. They, don't, they have modified uh, lateral blotches and they have no, no checkers. And then there is a striped allele. When it's present in the nomozygous form, you have these two uh, longitudinal lines. So also, conceptually, this is very interesting. This locus is very interesting because it, it sort of you know, makes us understand what's going on. How can you go from here to here? Because these two things are so different. But actually, you understand that it's joining the saddles and then separating them in the middle, basically. That's what 
is going on. And then in the paper that is submitted now, we show that this is a this one is a structural mutation. This one is a is a uh, regulatory mutation affecting the same gene that is affected here by the structural uh, mutation. Here we go. So we're gonna uh, uh, do these things. But then I I want to show you this tool. This is my favorite toy in the lab. Maybe you are interested. <laughs> Uh, this could be useful maybe for if you are doing morphometrics and things like that, for example. So we need to reconstruct, like for the crocodile, for example, we need to reconstruct with high precision both the geometry and the color texture. Okay, and we build this thing. So um, the yellow thing is just an industrial robot that you can buy off the shelf, but everything else we develop. It's an aluminium extension, a lot of electronics. These uh, LEDs here are very high. Uh, a resolution camera about 45 million pixels and of course the, all the computer science that goes with it and then you put your anesthetized animal in the middle uh, here on the stage and then the robot is taking pictures it's turning around and taking pictures and then you have to compare it's very very uh, computer intensive you have to identify features in all the pictures thousands of features this is, of course, done by algorithms that are automatic. And then you have to compare pictures two by two, identify the same features, and then you can triangulate these features in 3D space. Okay? Then you get a resolution of about 400 nanometers. Uh, 400, sorry, I, I wish. It would be <laughs> 400 microns. Okay, which is cool, which is already way better than anything commercial you can find. I can tell you that. They will say it's not true, but just try their systems. You know, their, their, their theoretical uh, resolution is complete. No, I'm not saying that. OK. Uh, anyway, so 400 uh, microns. This is not enough for some of the things we do. For the uh, uh, patterns, this is perfectly enough. But if you want to look at the position of scales and their shapes and things like that in small lizards, it's not enough. So we have a second, uh, a second approach, which, which is called photo, uh, photometric stereo where you stop the robot at a given place and then you take a picture for each LED, okay? So it's very easy to understand. You have your 45 million pixels and each pixel will have an intensity that will change as a function of the orientation of the light and the orientation of the pixel. And you can infer the geometry with a resolution of less than 40 microns, okay? So we have a texture resolution of 15 microns and geometric resolution of about 40 microns. That's really enough. And then with this robot, we can do what I've been dreaming for so long, which is to scan snakes. So you anesthetize a snake, and then you hang this poor snake <laughs> above, <laughs> above the first <laughs> one. And, and then you scan the guy, and, and that's it. Okay. So here is it to show you the resolution. Uh, you Indeed, you take a fly. You put it under a scanning electron microscope, you see the omatidias. You put it on, uh, under Robbie and you do see the omatidias. Okay. Yeah. There is no magnifying lens, right? So it's, uh, it's pretty wow. cool. If you're interested, there are movies available on YouTube. The reason we do that also is because geometry matters for Turing patterns. If you take two different geometries, even slightly different, this is a very technical paper that we wrote recently, we show that the patterns are very different. So the geometry matters. You need the real geometry of the animal to understand what's going on. And this is the multidisciplinary team. So Atanasia and I, then you have uh, postdoc physicists, postdoc uh, uh, development biologists, then uh, computer scientists, physicists, bioinformaticians, <laughs> computer scientists, mathematicians, developmental biologists, of course, uh, lab technicians, and fantastic animal technicians. You need that. We have about 200, 2,000 sorry, individuals in the animal facility. So um, Athanasia and uh, Assier did all these comparative genomics for scriptomics. I spoke about Nicolas Dipo was very much involved in scale placo development. Susan and, and Jeremy for the, the chameleon story. Alexandra continues on, on chameleons. Antonio developed Robbie, the, the, the robot. Sophie and Susan uh, did the genomic, uh, the, sorry, the gene mapping in snakes. The results I showed you. Um, Marcel, so these are technicians, and then you have uh, collaborators. So I told you about Marcos Gonzalez Guyton Lab, including Rita and Manuel, uh, Rita Matthews and Manuel de Ribery. And in Uppsala University, we have a fantastic collaborator for linkage mapping with uh, Leif Anderson uh, in Sweden. A few sponsors, and I just finished. Sorry, I've been probably way too long. Uh, 
uh, finish by telling you that the Department of Genetic and Evolution, uh, we call it Genève, <laughs> in Geneva, uh, will recruit soon two to four new faculty members at all levels, although we will probably favor junior positions. Um, any topic around uh, genetics development evolution, so it's only the quality of the candidates that will be important, not at all the specific topic. Thank you very much. Head out and I'm sure Michelle will be happy to take some questions. Go ahead, I'll let you call on me. Michelle? Yep. Uh, I just, what did you say that the crystals were made of again? Guanine. 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 And they're, and so they're, like in DNA. They're, <laughs> and they're pure. Sorry? They're pure? They're yes, not? this is a hydrous guanine. This is crystalline guanine. Yeah. So the way the crystals are formed, now I'm not talking about the photonic crystal, I'm talking about the nano crystal. Yeah. The way they are formed is totally unknown. And we are working with, uh, with um, collaborators in Israel doing crystallography to understand what is the exact uh, crystal structure. We have excellent data that came out very recently. Yes. Um, so, I wanted to ask, so the, the chameleon-specific runophores, what are they doing in the species that aren't really using color as a communication, as like constant communication, like in Burkhizia, like what would, what would they be doing? So you're speaking about specific chameleons, right? Yeah. So, um, what is interesting is that even if you take panther chameleons, these SE runophores of the low color change are forming a thick layer only in mature males. The immature individuals and the females, even mature females, have a very, very small layer, okay? So I would say by, by default, it's a D rid of four that are there in all the individuals. And again, that are possibly used for uh, protection against, against uh, too much energy uh, from the sun being absorbed by the animal. Now, I am not completely convinced that they are not involved in color change, but not in terms of hue change, but possibly in changing the intensity, again, of the color you see uh, on the skin of the individual. So I would say that in species that don't have bright color, again, the heavy rotophores, they have the two layers. And now, is it because the SE rotophores were important and were actually reduced through evolution? I don't know. But for example, I had a nice discussion about this with uh, Miguel Vences recently, uh, because some people indeed were saying, oh, come on, you know, Brochesia or some very small chameleons that are living in, in the litter and things like that. Why would they need SC redophores, right? But if you look at these species, you can make a very convincing case that they are very derived, actually, and not ancestral, right? By the way, they have many anatomical features that are uh, adaptation to arboreal lives, and they are not arboreal. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would suggest that they have lost this ability to use these SE redophores, and that this is actually an ancestral ability. Um, of course, it's going to be difficult to investigate. Yeah. Well, um, interestingly, the phylogenetic work on chameleons yeah. is in, uh, contradicts that interpretation. But my question has to do also with chameleons, and yep. that's the, on the flank of chameleons, on quite a few species, yep. there is an anterior kind of spot, like above the shoulder. Yes. And right. then it gradually disappears as it, as you go down the flank posteriorly. Yep. What is going on there? Because that's a common feature of many chameleons, and that particular region does not experience the same kind yep. of change that yep. the rest of the body does. Mm. So yeah, I have absolutely no idea. We didn't investigate that. Clearly, we focused on the panther chameleon, yeah. and there is tremendous, you know, variety among the different species of chameleons in their abilities to change color, in the way they change colors. So I don't expect that this is the whole story. Yeah. Uh, obviously, of course, and it would be super interesting to go into additional species. But as you know, <coughs> not super easy to breed these animals. Yeah. And, and, and investigate that properly. We are now having also, uh, um, you know, the um, helmet camera. How is it called? Helmet camera. Uh, 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 the common. Calipratus, yeah, calipratus. So, um, but 
yeah, going in some other species that would be fantastic, but that's going to require some work and, and big investment in terms of animal preservation. Yeah. Uh, what's known about how the 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 develop well the developmental pathways that integrates these pigments into the actual scales of the animals and kind of how does that change uh, through the age of an animal as it continues to molt and and may change in coloration with maturity. We don't know. Okay. Uh, but indeed, this is this is something we want to also investigate. But you know, we cannot do everything. But um, <laughs> this is obviously a super interesting question. If you take again the felsuma, for example, uh, the fact that you have these uh, you have these xanthophores that are associated with iridophores that are organized, and then when you look at the erythrophores that contain the same pigments, right, but with a different color, they are associated to disorganized erythrophores. So obviously, there are tons of fascinating intertalking uh, uh, processes during the development of these structures. And yeah, it would be fantastic to go into this. But these are long term projects for sure. Maybe one more question in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is in relation to the, uh, the crocodile and the physical practice. Yes. Um, so, in the selection for uh, structures that don't really have a basis as a developmental unit, and instead they're formed through like physical processes, you would expect in a macroevolutionary kind of perspective that you would have selection for decreasing thresholds for these physical processes to be more facile. Um, for example, in like uh, the proposed case of a callus of an ostrich, and that it becomes more easy to produce a callus over time. Uh, do you see signatures of this selective pressure? Um, in terms of the thickness of the skin of the crocodiles or any kind of uh, yeah. relative thing like that? Yeah. So obviously I can only hand wave about this, but um, I would say that it sort of makes sense because indeed uh, crocodiles have incredibly keratinized thick skin, especially on the face and jaws. This is just ridiculous. <laughs> okay. So if you think about it, these, these animals have to resolve something quite complicated, which is to to grow very fast these jaws while keratinizing it also very, very quickly. So um, I guess that it's easier to make it, you know, just continuous skin that it's keratinizing and then cracking. It's not true cracking, it's analogous to cracking. Rather than um, making, that's my interpretation, again, it's unwaving, but that you have scales that would develop. But if they get keratinized too fast, how do you want them to grow and join and form a cover that is continuous? So I would say that's, that would be the obvious um, explanation for it. How to test this? I guess that's going to be difficult. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. And, and given the poor uh, fossil record in terms of skin, you know, that's going to be a really yeah, so just to add a small uh, addendum to the question, you said that uh, large furrows form, and then from these large furrows, then you get these subsequent cracking patterns in the skin in the early embryonic stages. Um, do you have any idea of how initially these furrows uh, originate? Yeah, so that's what we investigate in right now. Because uh, if you take, again, again, if you take cracking, physical cracking of mud, you have the same thing, it's hierarchical. You have big cracks that appear first. Then you have secondary cracks that will be a bit less wide, that will be oriented differently, that will tend to join with the primary ones with 90 degrees angle, all these things. We see all these signatures. And we see this dynamically happening in the crocodiles. So <clears throat> we have three hypotheses. One of them is that tension is actually involved. All right? So you can imagine that when the uh, jaws are growing very fast, okay? And the skin is keratinizing, that's probably the most important aspect of it. You are changing what is called the young modulus yeah. of the skin, right? So it's become more easy to crack, okay? Uh, but still, it's not physical cracking, it's bulging, all right? So one hypothesis we have is that you have your tension field and that the tension field is linked to proliferation. This is not at all crazy if you speak to bio uh, a physicist uh, 
working on cell biology, there is clearly um, mechanical sensing by, by the cells, and they are changing their proliferation abilities, for example, or so they can, they can change their signaling uh, uh, through sensing mechanical stimuli, okay? So now that's all you need if you think about it. If you only have increased proliferation where you have increased tension, then you have your, your tension field, you will have heterogeneity, where the tension is big enough, you will have enough proliferation so that you get a very small bulge. If you get this small bulge, it should stop, because you, you dissipate the tension because of the bulge. You dissipate the tension in, uh, in, in the direction that is perpendicular to it, okay? So all the tension is redistributed at the tip of the bulge, which therefore should proliferate, which therefore should propagate, etc. It's exactly the same physics than true cracking, except that it's bulging. It's, so you have this proliferation in addition. So that's one hypothesis. The second hypothesis is that you don't have at all tension, but you have compression fields. Because actually you can generate patterns that look like cracking by compressing and forming folds. Right? So we are also investigating the Zivanimarco simulations and, and on the crocs, but that's not easy. Uh, and then there is a third hypothesis that we still cannot rule out although we have zero evidence so far, although we looked as much as we could, is that there is some signaling involved. Okay? But that's, I would say that's the least likely of the three hypotheses for me. Well, wonderful. Let's thank Michelle for a fascinating <laughs>